بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. So today إن شاء الله we're looking at uh, the same hadith of uh, Ibn Mas'ud رضي الله عنه uh, regarding the instances in which it is permissible to take the life of a Muslim person. And last week we looked at the explanation of Sheikh Saleh. Alu Sheikh, Abdullah, and today we're looking at we'll be going through the explanation of Sheikh Ibn Taymin, Rahimahullah. So the hadith from last week uh, from Ibn Mas'ud, Radilahu Anhu, who said, "Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the Messenger of Allah, Ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said, 'La yahillu damum ri'in Muslimin illa bi ihta thalas, illa bi ihta thalas." الثيب الزاني والنفس بالنفس والتارك لدينه المفارق للجماعة. That the blood of a Muslim man is not permissible except in one of three situations: the married fornicator, a, a soul for a soul, meaning a life for a life, and the one who abandons his religion separates from the jama'ah. Bukhari Muslim. So the Sheikh then begins his commentary and he says regarding the opening sentence la yahillu dhamum ri'in muslimin it is not permissible to take the blood of a muslim man he means what this means is it's not permissible to kill him and obviously what the sheikh means is that when it is said the blood of so and so is not permissible what that mean clearly means is it's not permissible to kill him so the taking of blood means killing obviously and the sheikh says that we this is how it's explained because this is known in the arabic language this is clearly known and understood in the arabic language that the use of this phrase like the blood of so and so that this refers to the taking of life and then the sheikh brings another hadith uh, to establish the same thing uh, in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said inna dima'akum wa amwalakum wa a'radakum alaykum haram indeed your blood and your wealth and your honor are all unlawful amongst you meaning the blood wealth and honor of each person is unlawful for others to take or to violate hadith bukhari as well then the sheikh says when the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said la yahillu dammu mri'in muslimin because here in the hadith it specifically said uh, the blood of a muslim man the sheikh says that this expression even though the messenger has used this expression muslim man this does not mean that the woman's blood is therefore lawful it doesn't mean that at all but the sheikh says that we find in the quran and in the sunnah and in the revelation in general in the sharia in general that whenever allah addresses uh, the creation we find that the male is most often the one addressed by the sharia more so than the, the than the female so we find all of the verses in the quran and all the commands and so on and so forth and you find that they are addressed uh, using the male you know the, the male form and you know the sheikh says this is because the men are those to whom the address is you know being directed to and by this it includes both the men and you know, the women then the sheikh says so the messenger said la yahillu dammu mri'in the blood of a male of a man of a man muslim dammu mri'in muslim a muslim so meaning this person whom we are speaking about then he has to have entered into islam then the, then the messenger said illa bi ihda thalath unless except by one of three things and then the messenger went on to explain so the sheikh says athayyib az-zani athayyib az-zani and the sheikh says athayyib az-zani this 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 one has been described which refers to the married adulterer 
it is permissible to take the blood of such a person. And the Shaykh goes on to give the definition, which, as you remember from the previous lesson, uh, the Shaykh Shaykh also gives the same definition that this is the person who has entered into a valid, legitimate nikah, so a proper Islamic nikah with all the conditions fulfilled and everything else, and who has consummated the marriage. I mean, he's he's had relations with 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 with, with you know with uh, the spouse, and so. If this person then commits adultery, a fornication, adultery, after Allah has blessed him and favored him with the nikah, with the you know the, the correct nikah, which Allah has blessed him with already, and he's already had relations within his nikah, and then he goes on to commit uh, adultery outside of that, then this person deserves to be uh, killed. And the way in which he is killed, the Shaykh says that we will discuss that in, in the benefits, when we look at the benefits in the Hadith. So the Shaykh says that what we understand then by the word athayyib, athayyib, because the, the word thayyib is very specific, it refers to a married person who's consummated the marriage and then who commits uh, fornication or adultery. The Shaykh says that from this we know that the virgin, the bikr, that such a one is not permissible to take his blood if he falls into fornication. And obviously this means that the, the, the vicar is the one who hasn't had relations within a valid and legal legitimate nikah. Right? This is what the definition of a, a, a vicar, a virgin is. Second situation, what nafsu bin nafs, uh, the shaykh says what is referred to here is al-qasas, this is the, the law of retribution. And uh, meaning that when one person kills another person deliberately and on purpose, then he can be killed as long as certain conditions are, are fulfilled. And the third one, وَالتَّارِكُ dinihi, meaning the person who obviously he becomes an apostate, he falls into a riddha, uh, and you know, whichever of the forms and types of riddha he falls into. Uh, this is the third situation. And when the messenger says, الْمُفَارِقُ jama'a then this is an explanation of the fact that the one who becomes an apostate has at the same time abandoned the jama'ah. Right? This is an explanatory uh, phrase. And uh, also the other meaning that we looked at last week it can also mean as well a person who separates from the main body of the Muslims and abandons their jama'ah, like for example the khawarij, those who rebel against the imam and who break away from the, you know, they, they leave and abandon one aspect of their religion and separate from the Jama'ah. So the Shaykh then, after giving this very brief overview of the Hadith, then goes into the benefits of the Hadith. And so he says, the first, first of all, the first benefit is that we respect and have re respect for the blood of the Muslims. This is because the Messenger وسلم, said, لا يحل دم امرئ مسلم The blood of a Muslim Man is not is not lawful, and the Sheikh says that this is a matter that the book and the Sunnah and the Ijma, the unanimous agreement of all of the uh, Muslim scholars and the Sahaba, that this is agreed upon. Allah says in the Quran, "وَمَن يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا." That whoever kills a believer deliberately on purpose then his recompense is Jahannam is the hellfire to remain there in and Allah's anger will be upon him and he will curse him and Allah has prepared for him a very great and mighty punishment so to kill a Muslim a Muslim who's innocent whose blood is innocent is from the greatest of the sins and this is why on the day of judgment the first of the affairs that will be judged, the first of the affairs will be the the the, the issue of the killings. Right? Those who are wrongfully killed, those dispute, disputations, those are the first things that will be, um, you know, in which which judgments will be passed on the day of judgment. Second benefit is that the as for someone who is not a Muslim, then. His blood is permissible to be taken, meaning outside of these three 
situations, his blood is permissible to be taken, as long as he does not fall into three categories. He is not a mu'ahad, a mu'ahad, and he is not a musta'min, a musta'man, or musta'min, musta'min is not someone who is musta'min, and he is not a dhimmi. And each of these three will be explained uh, by the Sheikh. So anyone who is a non-Muslim, that obviously he doesn't fall into this hadith, is excluded, so that blood is, is lawful and permissible, unless he falls into these three categories, Mu'ahad, Musta'min, and Dhimmi. And if he is one of these three, then again his blood is innocent and it's unlawful for his blood to be, to be taken. As for the, uh, the first one, Al-Mu'ahad, <coughs> Al Mu'ahad is anyone who has like a, a, a truce or a treaty or something along those lines between uh, be, between the Muslims, between himself and the Muslims. Like for example, the Prophet وسلم, had a, a treaty with the Quraysh, which was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Right. So anyone who you know fell into that treaty, then they weren't allowed. You know that their blood is. Inviolable, it is impermissible to be taken. So anyone who has a treaty or some sort of pact or some sort of agreement with the Muslims, then their blood is unlawful. Second, the Musta'min. A Musta'min is someone who is passing through the lands of the Muslims, and this can even be in a time of war, in a situation of war. So even when there's war between you know, a Muslim nation and a, a non-Muslim nation, and then you have people coming through or coming into the land, the Muslim land, and... They may come, for example, um, you know, he might come for trade, he might come to buy something, he might come to for some sort of work or whatever it is, whatever the reason is. But he comes, and he is given he is given by the Muslims a right of passage and a guarantee of safety. This person's blood is impermissible to be taken. His blood is innocent, and it's to be it's inviolable. It's not permissible to be taken. Even if this person was from the, 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 the enemy, the country of the enemy, even if he was to come and, you know, from those people who were you know, fighting against us in a conventional war, uh, but he, you know, for, for, for these reasons he is given right of entry, right of passage and uh, guarantee of safety for whatever his needs are, then, and this can, the, this can also, for example, refer to like ministers coming through, you know, even if they're from the people with whom we, we have a fight or, or, or a war or it could be people who are traders or whatever they just want to carry on the normalized you know uh, trade relations which can obviously take place in a, even in a situation of war then then th th these people their blood is inviolable their blood is imp impermissible and unlawful to be to be taken when when they are non muslims the third one is the dhimmi and the dhimmi is the person who lives amongst the Muslims and he pays a, a, a small tax and as a result of that tax then he has a guarantee of protection Muslims protect him he's not obliged to fight so let's say for example there's a war then he's not he's not obliged to fight along with the Muslims the Muslims rather have to protect him and you know various other rights to protect them and defend them and so on and so forth and they have the right to obviously practice their religion um, in, 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 you know, in, in, in the land, in the Muslim land, as they live amongst the Muslims, and they're, they're allowed to abide by their own laws and whatever else amongst themselves. So this dhimmi who gives this payment called the jizya, then this is in return for his protection and for him to be allowed to live in, in the land. So these three, their blood is unlawful to be to be taken. The third benefit, point number three the Sheikh makes, is that this hadith is another indication of the excellent manner of teaching of the Prophet wasallam, in the sense that we see often in his speech, he will always uh, break down his speech, and so he will, he will say, for example, that you know, he will categorize things. So, for example, like we see in this hadith, the blood of a Muslim is unlawful, except in three situations. You know, we see the same thing in other hadith. Like for example, six are the rights of a Muslim upon, you know, upon another Muslim, you know, and then we find this often in many, many different hadith. There are three characteristics, 
you know, of a hypocrite, which if a person possesses, he is an outright hypocrite. We, we see many examples of this in the teaching of the Prophet And the Shaykh says that this is something that, you know, it allows a person to very quickly remember things, to memorize them, and, you know, they're, they're, they're much more difficult to, to forget. So all of this indicates the excellent teaching of the Prophet Third, fourth benefit is that again, a thayyib zani which is the married adulterer, then this person is to be killed by stoning, by stoning. And the Sheikh says that uh, the way this takes place is that the people, obviously, they take this person, he stood, he's placed, and the people throw stones at him, which are neither too large nor too small. Because if they are too large, then this person will be killed very quickly, and therefore the objective behind stoning is lost. Right? The objective behind stoning is obviously as uh, you know for the people to see the evilness of this of this deed of uh, adultery. So if he's killed straight away, then the objective is lost. And if you use small, very small uh, stones, then what that does is that just prolongs the punishment, and you know it uh, uh, it, it it just you know, gives the person unnecessary harm and punishment before 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 he actually dies. So the point being, something in between, in the middle, and neither too large nor too small. And so this person is stoned in this manner, uh, whether it is a male or a female, up until this person person dies. And the Sheikh says, someone might now raise an objection. Now we might have some objection. Someone might say, then why do you kill this person in this manner? Why isn't this person, for example, killed with a sword? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا قَتَلْتُمْ فَأَحْسِنُوا الْقِتْلَ That if you kill, then be proficient in the killing. So in other words, they're trying to argue, why are you stoning? Why don't you just do it very quickly and do it in the most efficient manner? The Shaykh says, the answer is uh, that in this hadith, this hadith does, does not mean that you that you kill in the most efficient, easiest, quickest way. Rather, what is meant by ihsan in this hadith, it refers to that it has to agree with the Sharia. So the manner in which the Sharia has explained that a person in a given circumstance is to be killed, then it is from ihsan that you implement it in that manner. So, for example, here, and the and the and the, and, and the reason. Is because Allah has said, "Woman ahsanu min Allahi hukma," that who is better and more excellent than Allah in judgment. So Allah's judgment is the best judgment. So this, so therefore, if Allah, if the ruling in the Sharia is that a married adulterer is to be killed by stoning, then that is from ihsan. That is the most proficient and the most most appropriate and the most befitting uh, way. So to stone the married adulterer is itself from an ihsan and itself is something that agrees with with the sharia then the shaykh says someone might ask another question which is what is the wisdom in this person being killed in this way and the answer is the shaykh explains is that the this that the lust that is behind fornication right so when a person commits adultery married adulterer then you find that this lust of fornication isn't tied to just one specific limb rather the whole body is something that shares in that lust and that pleasure right so since this adulterer this married adulterer has sought pleasure with all of his body in this haram way then like then it is therefore appropriate and befitting that his whole body tastes the punishment as well so the whole of his body is subject to, to punishment. And so therefore, when he's stoned in this manner, then the whole of his body will taste that punishment, just like the whole of his body tasted that pleasure unlawfully in, you know, in the case of a married adulterer. Next question is, the Sheikh asks, is okay, how then can it be established that a person has committed zina? What is, how do we establish that a person has committed zina? And the answer is, the Sheikh says that a zina, meaning this uh, illegal uh, for, 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 this fornication, the Sheikh says it is established by four 
upright men, for upright men, who are known, obviously, mardiyin, meaning that their, their, their testimony and their word is accepted, and they are upright and whatever, and they are known as such within, within the society. Four of them have to... Have, the, the, the four of them have to have seen, this is very specific, four men, upright men, who are accepted within the society, have to see with their own eyes the male penetrating the female. So all of this has to, have, has to be. So it has to be, they have to actually see the male, and you know, uh, physically entering the, the, the male, as the Sheikh explains, that the male organ has to be in the female organ. And they have to see that with their eyes. And the Sheikh says that this testimony, that this testimony to establish adultery is extremely, extremely difficult. To such a degree that Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah said that, adult, that uh, fornication in this manner has never ever been established by way of the shahada, by way of the four witnesses, ever. Obviously, he said that in his time. So from the time, from the time of the Prophet وسلم, up until the time of Shaykh Salam Taymiyyah, that is roughly over 700 years. In those 700 years, never established that anyone was ever convicted of zina by way of the shahada, by way of the uh, four, four witnesses. So this is, this, is a, this is just one way though. The second way is, obviously, if the person uh, admits that they committed fornication. So this is self-admission. Self, uh, and the Sheikh says, now there's a question here, another, another issue here, which is that, does the person have to repeat his admission three times or four times, four times, or is it sufficient just the once? Right? And should we distinguish between a case in which it has become widespread and known and public knowledge that this person committed fornication and a case in which it hasn't become widespread? So what are, what, what are the various issues, you know, what are the various rulings in this? The Sheikh says that on these issues there is obviously a different amongst the pe- difference amongst the people of knowledge. And so those people who said that uh, a person must repeat his ad- admission, his confession, they bring the evidence of the incident of a companion called Ma'iz, Ma'iz bin Malik, radiallahu anhu, and he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said, "I have committed fornication." So uh, the messenger turned away from him. He came again. He said, "I've committed zina." The messenger turned away from him again, and he said again, "I've committed zina." So he turned from him again, away from him again. Then he said it a fourth time, you know, that he's committed zina, he's committed fornication. Then he turned from, from, away from him again. And then, oh, sorry, sorry, after the third time, so he turned away from, from him three times. Then the fourth time he said to him, are you mad? Did you have some sort of junoon? Are you mad? And Ma'is said no. So then the messenger sent Ma'is to his people. And he, or sorry, he sent someone to his people. He sent a messenger to the people of Ma'iz, his tribe or his people. And he, and he asked them, is Ma'iz, do you know him to be someone who is mad? Are you mad or possessed or he doesn't know what he's saying or whatever. So they said, no. He said, no, he's not mad. Then the messenger asked, ordered another man to see if he can smell any alcohol or intoxicant from him. See if he's drunk. So he went to see if he's you know, drunk something or he's you know, intoxicated. So when nothing was found, he wasn't intoxicated, then uh, the Messenger وسلم, gave the order for him to be, to be stoned. So the people who say that, uh, that there has to be a repetition in this confession, they use this story. And they say that the Prophet وسلم, didn't accept the admission of this man or the confession of this man the first time uh, and the reason is because he obviously <coughs> doubted doubted it and he wanted to uh, verify the situation as for the other people who say that you know just once is sufficient then they give the example of uh, again uh, the woman 
who committed uh, fornication with uh, someone whom her husband had taken as you know he had hired someone uh, like as a, as, a, as a servant or as a help or an aide or something in the house or whatever and she committed uh, fornication with 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 with, with this uh, person and this person was a youth and what happened is that the story became well known people came to know about it and what happened mm -hmm. is that as a result of this incident which took place some dispute happened and uh, the father of the of the youth it was said that the father of the youth had to give um, you know uh, he had to give like 100 uh, sheep and likewise a slave girl as a, if you like a compensation to the other side and this is what happened this is what took place that this this father of this youth he gave the compensation to the other side so then what happened was that this issue was raised to uh, the people of obviously the people of knowledge and they said that you know this you, you can't do this this is you can't do this this is not correct rather your son has to uh, be lashed a hundred times and he's to be exiled for a year and as for the female, as for the lady, as for the, the, the woman she has to be stoned and then what happened was that the issue then eventually got raised to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said uh, that the messenger said that the, that, the, that the flock, meaning the sheep and the slave girl that was given is rejected right? They rejected because they've been taken upon other than the truth, upon other than the due right. And then he said, upon your son, again to the father, upon your son uh, is a hundred lashes and exile for a year. This is because the, because the youth wasn't married. He wasn't married, so he gets the lashing. And as for the, the female, the messenger ordered someone, uh, someone called Anis. He said, go, go tomorrow or Anis to the woman. And if she admits and acknowledges, then stone her. And so he went to her and she uh, confessed and then obviously she was, she was stoned. So here the, the, the people who argue, they say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, you know, he, he didn't say to her, seek her confession four times. He just said, seek her confession. And if she does so, then stone her. And this shows that for a person to repeat the confession a number of times is not something... It's not a condition, and this is because um, this is because in general, all of the rights that Muslims have, or that are, uh, are due from a Muslim or upon a Muslim, they don't need to. They don't have to be established by asking three times or four times. Just once, once is enough. And the same applies to the issue of zina. And the Sheikh says that some of the other people of knowledge they explained that uh, if a situation becomes publicized and well known right so now it's open in the society then all that needs to be done is that the person needs to confess once right especially if this situation is well known this incident is well known it's, it's spread amongst the people and if not if it's just something that hasn't been known and spread amongst the people nobody really knows about it and it's quite you know it's restricted then in this case then you know there must the, the sheikh the sheikh says that some of the people say that there must be a repetition a person must must repeat it um, uh, again in order to to uh, you know to 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 make the verification. So the scholars say that in this incident of of this of this uh, boy and and this uh, you know this uh, this this woman, this became well known and it became raised to the to the people and then other people got involved and it became public. So for that reason, there wasn't any need for you know r repeating the the verification or repeating the the, the confession. The Sheikh says that which is most correct, the Sheikh says that which is most correct is that the repetition isn't necessary unless there is a reason to doubt, unless there is something that gives you a reason to doubt. So therefore, to make the verification and to you know find the evidence to make the person you know properly establish and confirm, then in that situation, you know, it's 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 it, 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 it can be justified if there's a reason to doubt. Um, 
The Sheikh says, otherwise, there's no reason for a person to keep repeating his confession. How, if a person is he's above the age of puberty, he's sound in his mind, he knows what he is saying, and then, and, you know, how can someone say, well, we can't accept this as a, as a confession? This, this, this is not correct. Right? So, uh, the Sheikh says, what is correct is that a person confesses even just once is sufficient, unless there is something that exists that, 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 that basically gives a reason for doubt That gives a reason for, for, for creating doubt Next issue the Sheikh discusses is now the issue of uh, You know, the issue of homosexuality And is this considered the same as a zina? The Sheikh says, yes it is the same But rather it is akhbat, it is more vile and more filthy Because this action of this act of homosexuality, uh, there's no in this situation. There's no condition that they have to be that they both have to be thayyib, right? In other words, they don't. Person doesn't have to be a married person who then committed homosexuality. Rather, it's just the act itself, right? Whereas in in zina, the person for the person to be killed, they have to be married, consummated the marriage then commit zina. With the action of homosexuality, of sodomy, then there is no requirement that a person be thayyib, as in married, and there's nothing like that. Rather, the only condition that, that is required is that they are people who are above the age of, uh, you know, the abalik, meaning they are above the age of recognition, and they are sound in mind. They are sound in mind. And if they fulfill this condition, then the punishment is implemented upon them both. What is the punishment then? The Sheikh says that the scholars differ. Uh, some of the scholars of the Hanbalis, they say that uh, it's just the same as the punishment for zina. So, for example, the thayyib, so anyone who is married, consummates his marriage and then he falls into sodomy, that one is killed, he's stoned. And as for the one who is not a thayyib, then he is stoned, uh, lashed a hundred times and then exiled. The Sheikh says, however, even though the Hanbali scholars, from the scholars from the Hanbalis have said this, this requires evidence. This requires evidence because there is no, the, there is no evidence, um, you know, there is, there, is, there is no evidence apart from this like weak reasoning. This weak reasoning is that just like the one who commits adultery has done something unlawful, then likewise the one who commits sodomy has done something unlawful. They have tried to link the two things together and on that basis say that the punishment is the same. The Sheikh says this is a very poor uh, justification. It's not very strong at all. And second thing is that also, even though you're trying to make an analogy between the two things, you're trying to compare between the two things, there's a big difference. The big difference is that the action of sodomy is much more filthy, vile and evil. Much more filthy, vile, vile and evil. So, you know, how, you know, uh, how, you know, there's, there's a big difference here, so you can't really make the, the analogy there. The Sheikh says, some people actually have said that the, the two people who have fallen into sodomy, both the doer and the one to whom it is done, he says that some people say that they should only be disciplined meaning that they should receive like some sort of punishment as a, as a, to be disciplined. The Sheikh says, this is not correct. This is not correct, as we shall see, because we will bring evidence to, to prove that this is not correct. And uh, the Sheikh says uh, that this is very strange that this should be, that this should be narrated coming from some, some of the people, you know, uh, some, from some of the scholars, those who say that, you know, um, uh, that there's nothing upon them, um, you know, uh, that the only thing that they should receive is just some sort of like, you know, exemplary punishment and, you know, uh, just like, for example, uh, if a person uh, was to drink wine, for example, he would be punished, right? He would be, he would be lashed or something. And likewise, if a person did this, the Sheikh says this is a very, very big mistake for, for anyone who makes this claim. It's a big mistake upon the Sharia. And it is a qiyas, it is an, an analogy which is batil, you can't make such analogies because, because any person who 
you know, takes the virginity of someone else, then, you know, how, how can how, we can't accept that we don't punish such a person? You know, we we will punish such a person because this is a dis, this disobedience, and punishment is obligatory in all types of uh, is only punishment. Sorry, the exemplary punishment, which is ta'zir, ta'zir, which is an exemplary punishment, is only for those actions of disobedience in which a specific had punishment has not been mentioned in the Sharia, or for which a kafara has not been mentioned in the Sharia, right? But as for those in which there is a specific punishment, then we can't go away from that and then just, then and then just give you know like an exemplary punishment as a as a, as a, as a form of discipline. We can't do that. Uh, and the Sheikh says that this viewpoint of some of the scholars is is is, is, an, as a, is a very is, is a Barton viewpoint, and we shouldn't really quote it to the people. Just like, for example, a Hadith Da'if, we shouldn't mention Hadith Da'if unless we are explaining to the people that it is Da'if. Right? It shouldn't otherwise be, be quoted. So, in a similar manner, the, the likes of these viewpoints of certain scholars, which are incorrect in Ba'atil, that we don't start mentioning them to, amongst the amongst the people because they 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 they're, they're false. Anyway, the Sheikh says what is correct is the fa'il and the maf'ul, the doer and the one to whom it is done. Both of them are to be killed as long as they are, you know, they are uh, above the age of recognition, uh, of puberty, and you know, of age and maturity, and that they are both sound in intellect. And if they fulfil this condition, then um, you know they are to be to be killed. The reason is the Sheikh says that this really is like a disease. It's like an infection within the society. And if it becomes, if it spreads amongst the society, then the whole society will become corrupt. And how, the Sheikh asks the question, how, how is it possible for a person to whom it is done, who has been sodomized, to whom, it is done, to whom it has been done, how can this person face the people, come out and face the people, where in reality he is like, he's like a woman, like, like, a, like a woman, you know, she, she, she is passive and she receives, you know, the, 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 you know, the action of the male. Then this person who is sodomized, and he's like a woman. So how can this person walk amongst a society where the whole meaning and the concept of manhood, the concept of manhood, where it is being, you know, destroyed? Right? So this action of sodomy is a destruction of the concept of, of manhood. Where the one who is passive, the one to whom it is done, it's like as if he's the the, 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 the female. So uh, then the Shaykh quotes Shaykh Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah who said that the Sahaba are all of them all of them are agreed upon the killing of the fa'il and the maf'ul, the one who is the doer and the one to whom it is done. And it is it occurs in the in the hadith, in fact, in an authentic hadith, in which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said مَنْ وَجَدْتُمُوهُ يَعْمَلُ عَمَلَ قَوْمِ لُوطٍ فَاقْتُلُوا الْفَائِلَ وَالْمَفْعُولَ وَالْمَفْعُولَ بِهِ That the one whom you find doing the action of the people of Lut, then kill the doer and the one to whom it has done. And the Sheikh says, uh, so this is unite, this is agreed upon by the Sahaba, but the Sahaba differed, how are they to be killed? How are the two to be killed? That's what they differed upon. So the Sheikh says, some of them said they're to be burned with a fire. And it's been narrated from Abu Bakr radiallahu uh, anhu that, you know, uh, that, this, that this action was done. And this is because of the, you know, the evil, evilness of the action. And so they, t- they are to be punished with the most evil types of punishment, which is to, or the most, you know, the harsh types of punishment, which is burning with a fire. And... What, and also because burning with the fire is instills more fear in other people to keep away from this act. Others said they to be stoned, just like the married adulterer is stoned. Others said that they be, that they are to be taken to a, the, the, the 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 highest place in 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 the, in the town, the highest place, and then they are to be uh, thrown, and then after they've been thrown, that is then followed up with stoning. Um, and this is based upon the fact that this is what Allah did to the people of Lut when Allah punished them. Similar, similar, similar punishment. The Sheikh says the most important thing is, is irrespective of how they are killed, the, the doer and the one to whom it is done, that they are killed in any case, no matter how it's done. As long as 
they are above the age of uh, you know, adolescence, puberty, maturity, and they are also are sound in, in mind. And the Shia says this is because this is actually a disease. This is a disease, and it's something that you can't really, um, you can't really, um, the word, what, what the Sheikh is saying is, for example, if you were to, the Sheikh explains here that if you were to see a man with a woman, with a woman whom he's got no, you know, he's, he's not a relative, he's not like a, a father or a son or whatever, but he's with a woman who we know is not, you know, not mahram to, then uh, we can say, what, what are you doing? How, how, who is this woman? We can ask these questions, when is it a man and a woman? When you see two men, you don't, you don't suspect anything. Right? Because this is something that's hidden within the society. It's an, e- it's an evil that's hidden within the society. So because of that, it's something that can go around and take place, but we're not really, we, can't, we can't really take caution against it. So for that reason, uh, the Sheikh is saying that because this is an evil disease, then this is why we find you know, the, the severity of, of the, 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 the punishment. So therefore, the Sheikh says, uh, the... Uh, the Fayyib then, a Fayyib Uzani, is uh, the one who commits a Fayyib Uzani, the married adulterer. His blood is lawful, and and likewise with the the uh, sodomists, the the people who fall into sodomy, their blood is lawful likewise, irrespective of whether they are married and co- and and con- con- consuming the marriage or not. Right? That's the difference in that one, in in that case. So now the question is, who implements the punishment? Who implements the punishment? Something that we discussed last week as well from uh, Sheikh Salih al Sheikh. Sheikh says, the answer is, it's not for anybody to do that. It's not for anybody to do that. Rather, it must be the Imam or anyone whom the Imam delegates. So the proof of that is, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you remember in the example of the hadith of the, the uh, woman, the married woman and the, the youth, the messenger said to the companion, go, go tomorrow or Anis to the woman, and if she admits, then stone her. So he sent a na'ib, he sent, he delegated someone to go now to fulfill the, uh, the, the stoning. So either the imam of the Muslimin does it, or anyone whom he delegates to go and do it, they are the ones who are allowed to implement the Sharia uh, rulings. If every person you know, was to just go out there and kill this one who fornicated and kill that one and this and whatever like we said last time this will just cause confusion in the society and evil within the society uh, which which no one the extent to which no one would know except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why the scholars say it is not permissible to establish the had to establish the the, the, the prescribed punishment and nor the ta'zirat ta'zirat meaning which are those exemplary punishments that are given which which are outside of the hudud, then no one is to do that except the imam and his delegate, the one whom he delegates, the na'ib. <coughs> okay, now we move on to the second. So we've covered a thayyib uzani. Next is a nafsu bin nafs, which is a life for a life or a soul for a soul. This is when one person kills another person who is equal to them in terms of the religion, in status, in terms of the religion, and in terms of the status of being slave, being a slave or being free, in these two, yeah, deen and the status in terms of being a slave or not. So the Sheikh says, uh, with respect to the religion, then a Muslim cannot be killed for a kafir because they are not equal in religion, because the Muslim is of a higher status than a kafir. As for the other way around, then a Muslim, then a Kafir, can be killed for killing a Muslim. And the next question is, is it a condition that the one who kills should not be from the um, the genealogy of the one being killed? In other words, for example, uh, the reason why the Sheikh is raising this is because some, some of the scholars, they say that in order for a 
person to be to be killed in this manner, then he cannot be either, for example, the father or the grandfather or the mother or the grandmother. Right? This refers to the uh, the genealogy which ascends, going going upwards. Right? And and, and they, they they mention this condition. And the Sheikh says that obviously a father can't be killed on account of his son. And the reason why they said this is that they brought a hadith لا يقتل, لا يقتل الوالد بوالدي, بوالده, that a father is not to be killed by way of his uh, son and then, they sh- and then they say that because the father is the foundation or he is the basis for the existence of the son then it is not correct or not befitting that the son should be the reason or the cause for the killing of the, of the father or the absence of the father the Sheikh says that other people of knowledge said this, this, is, this, this is not a condition. Um, you know, a father can be killed on account of his son when we know that he killed him on purpose. Because the evidences are very clear. And nafs bin nafs, like in this hadith. And likewise in, in, the, in the Quran, وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ عَلَيْهِمْ فِيهَا أَنَّ النَّفْسَ بِنْ نَفْسِ that we, that we prescribed for them, in it, a life for a life. And so... Uh, some other scholars also said that this hadith that you've mentioned a father is not to be killed on account of his son, this hadith is da'if this hadith is da'if and so therefore we can't we can't take an evidence which is weak and not established and use it to clash against an evidence which is very firmly established, we can't do that so uh, so and, and as for the argument they try to bring which is that you know because the father was the was the basis and origin of the son, then the son shouldn't really be the reason for a removal of the father. The Sheikh says this is a very very weak argument, a very, very very weak argument. You know, if the father is someone who deliberately and on purpose, you know, killed his son or anyone from his from his offspring, then this is from the most you know severe t- types and forms of cutting off of the ties of kinship. Right? This is from the greatest of the forms of cutting off of the ties of kinship. You know, actually killing one of your one of your, one of your relatives. In this case, your offspring. Or, you know, so the Sheikh says, how then can we deal with this person, this oppressive, transgressing person who cuts off the ties of kinship? And you know, how can we treat him with mercy and with gentleness, with with, with gentleness and, and so on and so forth? So we, we this. You know, we can't, we can't say this. In this case, there would be no, 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 no such thing as retribution. So the correct answer is, the Sheikh says, that the father is to be killed if he kills his, his offspring, uh, irrespective of whether it is a male, like the father, or a female, like the mother. Finally, the Sheikh moves on to the third one, which is Atarik Lidinihi, the one who abandons his religion. And the Sheikh says... Uh, meaning the murtad al mufariku lil jama'a, meaning the one who leaves the jama'a to uh, the, the the main group of the Muslims, the Sheikh says this person is obviously to be to be to be killed. The one who abandons the religion, separates from the the Muslims. But the Sheikh says this question here now is that is his toba to be sought first uh, before you kill before you kill him? Is his toba to be sought? The Sheikh says on this issue there's a difference amongst the scholars. Some of them say he's not to be, his repentance is not to be sought, rather just by falling into kufr, he is to be killed, because the Prophet ﷺ said, Man baddala deenahu faqtuluh, that anyone who changed his religion and kill him, and the messenger didn't mention Tawbah. This is the view of some scholars. Other scholars say that this person, he is given three days to make Tawbah. Three days, he's given three days. And this is if he is from those people from whom Toba is to be accepted. What this means is, is that there can be some types of people who they fall into uh, apostasy, but they do it in a manner which is not forgivable in any form. Right? So, so therefore, in that small category of people, you don't ask for their Toba. Right? So if the person who leaves his religion is not in that category, but is just from the other general category who leave the religion, then in that case, some of the people, the scholars say, that his um, you know, repentance is to be sought over three days. And because some of, the, some of the apostates, their repentance can be accepted, and others may not be accepted. And the Sheikh says, so three days are given to him, 
and we say to him, you've got the period of three days, and if you, you know, accept Islam again, we'll you know, remove this uh, punishment of, of, of death, of killing, and if not, then we will, you know, we, we, we will kill that person. This is, what is, this is what is done. The Sheikh says, so what is, what is correct? Because obviously there's, there's a difference of opinion. The Sheikh says what is most correct is it comes back down to the ijtihad of the Hakim. It comes to the ijtihad, to the decision or the judgment of the ruler. So if he sees that there's going to be a maslaha or some sort of benefit in seeking this person's repentance, then, okay, then he can seek his repentance, give him three days. If not, then no. If, if he doesn't see any maslaha, then no. Rather, he says that anyone who changes his religion, then kill him. And this is because the... Uh, and this is because um, it is known from the Sahaba Rudlahu Anhu that they did that they did actually seek people's uh, repentance. The Sheikh says this is different to a situation when a man he becomes a kafir and he openly announces his kafir, right? So he now he openly announces it to everybody and you know, makes a, a display of it. In this case, the Sheikh says it's not desirable that we seek his repentance. You know, because if this person had been such that he kept his kufr hidden, if he kept his kufr hidden, you know, if he kept it um, uh, hidden, and he didn't publicize it, and it was just like to himself, and maybe small category of people, then in that case, in that case, then we wouldn't need to Seek his repent, you know, seek his repentance. But because he openly publicised it, then, uh, then, 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 uh, then we don't seek his repentance. But if, for example, he kept it, you know, quiet, whatever, and then we saw in this person, okay, maybe the the, the, the Imam saw that he's got a desire for repentance and for rectification and so on and so forth, then maybe he might see, okay, maybe he, he you know, we can see a maslaha in in seeking his repentance. Uh, the Sheikh says the reason why we make this clarification here, why we say that the that the Hakim, that the ruler has an ijtihad, is because that those who become apostates, they fall into two types. The first of those apostates are those whom repentance can be accepted. And there are others are those whose repentance cannot be accepted. The Sheikh explains. For example, the person whose apostasy becomes great. It's like a great, like for example, he starts cursing and reviling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or he curses and reviles the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or he curses and reviles the Book of Allah, the Book of Allah, the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if he, if, he, if he falls into any of these great and severe things, and he does things which are great, like evil, very evil, like for example, let's say he takes the Quran and he throws it in some filth or something or whatever, and we see from him such actions which are very uh, evil and nasty and despicable, which represent a very severe form of apostasy, then in this case the Sheikh says this Tawbah of such a person not accepted. Not accept, not, mm, tawbah is not to be sought from this person. And uh, The Sheikh says this, 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 this is what, what is what, what is said. However, the Sheikh says, um, the Sheikh says this, there is another viewpoint which is which 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 tends to be to be stronger. Some some people have also said that we can accept his tawbah, even if, for example, the way he became an apostate was very serious and very grave. If, like, for example, he reviled Allah, the Messenger of the Book, and even if he was a hypocrite, for example, but we have to be look at the situation very very he says very very carefully and think we have to think is will this man if he if we accept his tawbah will he be someone who will remain upright and steadfast so after falling into this apostasy in very in a very grave and serious way if we accept it from him will he then remain in this manner if we know that this man and we know from from whatever circumstantial evidence that this man is truthful in his repentance uh, then, of, then of course we, we, we have to accept that from him. As he says, as Allah says, قُلْ يَا إِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَفْرُوا ذُنُوبَ جَمِيعًا 
Allah says, O my servants who have transgressed against their souls, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. And also because the, mess- the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, Tawbah destroys whatever is before it. And this is general, so therefore it would include all types of apostasy and, and disbelief and whatever. And it has other evidence as well. This is what the Shaykh says. Uh, it appears to be most correct again, but this comes back down to the again to the to, to the Imam. The Sheikh says, but this is what seems to be most correct. The Sheikh says, likewise, the one who mocks the religion, even the one who mocks the religion, then his tawbah can be accepted. So if if tawbah is the chance to make tawbah is presented to him, then he you know, makes tawbah, then it's accepted. As Allah says in the Quran, wala in sa'altahum la yakulunna inna ma kunna nakhudu wa nalab. قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَعْزِئُونَ لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ إِنْ نَعْفُ عَنْ طَائِفَةٍ مِّنْكُمْ نُعَذِّبُ طَائِفَةٍ Shaykh mentions a verse in the Quran that if you were to ask them, they would say, we were just joking and just playing around. Then say, is it in Allah and His signs and His messengers that you were mocking? Do not seek to make excuses for you have, in, that you, for you have disbelieved after having faith. And if we pardon a group amongst you, we will punish another group. So here, Allah has clearly said that if we pardon a group amongst you, Allah wouldn't pardon anyone unless the tawbah was accepted for that particular sin. Right? So this proves that even those who uh, make mockery or attempt, then their tawbah can be accepted as well. And regarding the hypocrites, Allah says regarding the hypocrites, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِكِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ وَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُمْ نَسِيرًا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَأَسْلَهُوا وَأَعْتَسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ وَأَخْلَصُوا دِينَهُمْ لِلَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَسَوْفَ, يو... وسوف يُؤْتِ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Allah says, indeed the hypocrites are in the low steps of the hellfire and you will not find any helper for them except those who make repentance and rectify and hold fast to Allah and purify their religion for Allah then they are those who will be with the believers. And soon will Allah give to the believers a great reward. So clearly, even a hypocrite can repent and his tawbah can be accepted. So the, the shaykh says what is correct is every kafir, kullu uh, kafir in asli, a kafir who is initially a kafir, and anyone who is a murtad, meaning who was initially a Muslim but then became a kafir, and irrespective of what type of kufr he fell into, then his tawbah can still be accepted. His tawbah can, can still be accepted. However, the shaykh says, with respect to these people, they have to be watched. They have to be watched. We have to watch their situation. Are they really truthful? Or are they just you know, playing about with us? Are they fooling around with us? Are they mocking us you know, by you know, displaying Islam outside and concealing kufr inside and just trying to fool us and deceive us? The shaykh says, uh, they have to be watched and to see have they truly returned to Islam or not truly returned to Islam? So if they re- repent, then the, obviously the, ki- the, 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 the death penalty is removed from them. And because obviously the, the, the ruling of death was for their kufr, but since the kufr has gone, then you know, we accept their tawbah, and so the ruling is, is removed from them of the penalty of, of, of death. The shaykh says there is one exception, which is the issue of reviling the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam the issue of abusing and reviling the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is because even though his repentance might be accepted so even if a person repents from it then he is still killed um, and this person is killed um, you know in the sense that sheikh says uh that even though he repents, so let's say a Muslim, he abuses and reviles the Prophet wasallam, then even though he makes tawbah, he is to be killed, even though we pray janazah over him, we bury him along with the Muslimin, we bury him in, you know, in, in the same thing, we, we wash him, we shroud him, and then we bury, pray over him, we bury him. Because right? obviously his tawbah has been accepted, but he is still, we don't need him alive, because anyone who abuses... Uh, uh, the messenger, then he's not to be left alive. As for, as for the one who abuses Allah the Mighty Majestic, and then he repents, then he's not to be killed. <coughs> okay, so now you might ask the question, the Shaykh says, now you might ask the question, how can 
how can you know is is reviling Allah less than reviling the messenger someone asked this question the Sheikh says no reviling Allah is more serious and grave than reviling the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam however Allah has informed us that he pardons anyone who transgresses you know in this manner when the servant repents so when the person repents then we know that Allah you know will will turn to him and accept his repentance this is because Allah has informed us such as for the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam then uh it has never been said, he never said, whoever reviles me and mocks me and then repents, then, you know, I will, my right, I will, I will leave my right, you know. Um, so for that reason, we kill this person because he, re- because he reviled the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and that is the right of a, of, a, of a human, right? That is the right of a human, which we don't know has it been pardoned or not, because the messenger is not alive. To you know, to 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 to, to judge or to part pardon such a person. So the Sheikh says, yeah, but then somebody might say, how come the Prophet sallallahu he pardoned certain people who reviled him and abused him in his lifetime, and yet they weren't killed? The answer is that this uh, this still doesn't change anything because if he pardoned someone, we know that he pardoned them, and so in that case. You know, so be it. But after his death, how can we know that the Messenger ﷺ has pardoned such and such a person? And the answer is that we do not know. We don't, there's no way for us to know. And so for that reason, we can't analogize between the time in which the Prophet ﷺ was alive and in the time that the Prophet ﷺ is, 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 has passed away. And also because we fear that if, if after the passing away of the Messenger ﷺ, if we didn't take this approach and didn't obviously implement the penalty upon this person, then people would this this issue of reviling the Prophet ﷺ would become very very light. It would become widespread. It would become very very um, people wouldn't treat it to be serious, and the fear that the people have and the awe that the people have in their hearts as it relates to the status and the position of the Messenger ﷺ, then the people wouldn't have that in their hearts. And they would take it very, 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 very lightly, and so therefore they would, you know, revile and abuse the messenger, uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and, you know, uh, for, that, for that reason we see the difference between uh, a person not being, grant, you know, uh, not being absolved of the, of, the, of the penalty for abusing the messenger, but as for Allah, then that person can be forgiven. That's why there is the, the difference. So with that, the Sheikh finishes the explanation. That's the end of this hadith. Our explanation of this hadith. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll end this lesson here and we'll start the new hadith in the next lesson, which is the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, uh, well known, famous hadith. Whoever believes in Allah and the Messenger, uh, whoever believes in Allah on the last day, let him speak good or otherwise remain silent. So, inshallah, we'll start that next week.